All right, no doubt KD was great, but Houston didn't take my advice and played ISO ball all night. Cowherd, what was the bigger reason for the Warriors' win? Kevin Durant or the Rockets' ISO ball? Uh, the Rockets' ISO ball. This is why I picked Golden State in five. Um, the Rockets are like preparing for a spelling bee. Teacher gives you 50 words on Friday. She gives you 50 words on Friday. You got to memorize a few. Then you come out Monday and take the test. Houston, they do some ISO ball. Figure that out, you beat the Rockets. Warriors are an SAT. You got to do math. You got to do reading. You got to do writing. You got to have an essay. Layers, layer. Last night, Steph wasn't good. Rockets got off to a great start. CP and Harden were both great. And it wasn't close. This is what makes a dynasty. Golden State's best shooter can have an off night on the road, fall into a 10-point hole early, and they're cruising by the end of the third. It, it was the culture class I kind of expected. One team playing a very iso ball style, four guys standing around, and the Warriors in constant motion. H having said all that, and I, and I do think the Rockets played the wrong way and they overdosed on the iso ball. Having said that, though, Watching this seven-foot Kevin Durant be a problem that has no solution. The only thing they could have done is stacked uh, P.J. Tucker and Eric Gordon on top of each other. <laughs> That's the only double team that worked. The guy's seven-foot, and he can hit every shot on the court. From half-court, once he crossed the half-court line, every shot's makeable. And when you're seven-foot tall and they got midgets guarding you, they just didn't have, there was uh, no solution. Here's the thing. If it wasn't KD, it would have been somebody else. Steph would have had the big game, or Clay would have had even more points. I'm not taking anything away from KD. He was great. But I'm with Colin. It was more the clash of cultures. And you said they should take your advice and change. They can not change. That was a nice, cute, and funny quote by Mike D'Antoni. But that might be what he does. Go score 55. <laughs> I mean, they're not going to adjust. That's, look. And, and it wasn't just ISO versus team basketball. It was also the philosophy that stems from Daryl Morey, the GM in Houston, all the way down. Yes. Three-pointer or at the rim mm -hmm. versus a variety of ways to score. Durant isn't shooting a lot of threes. He took six, but he was killing you with the mid-range. During the season, the Warriors shot 23 point, 20 mid-range shots per game. The uh, Rockets shot less than seven. And how many of that was Chris Paul? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if exactly. it wasn't for Chris right. Paul, it'd be exactly. about two per game. Right. And that's real talk. So that's it, too. That makes you harder to guard when you might take a three, you might go mid-range, you might go back door, you might go at the rim versus a three-pointer or a dunk by Houston. I'm going to say both because, one, you don't have an answer for Kevin Durant. And the beauty of what Golden State does, they spread you out. So Kevin Durant has space to work in. I'm not like a lot of other superstars who are always seeing a body, a front of the jersey when they're trying to drive. With Golden State, because they move the basketball, they move bodies, it opens up lanes. And when you're seven foot, you can jump over the top. Now, keep in mind, this is a different D'Antoni offense. The one I played in in Phoenix, totally different. We shot a lot of three-point shots, but it came off of passes. Steve Nash, he dribbled with purpose. Yeah. He had the ball with purpose. The pick and roll with Amari at the free throw line, it was tough to guard. As soon as the ball touched somebody, didn't have a shot, it moved. With this team, keep in mind, you contrast the two teams. Houston's three best players, okay? Eric Gordon, you talk about Chris Paul, James Harden, ISO player. Yep. Three best players for Golden State. Durant, Steph, Clay. Shoot off the dribble, shoot off pick and roll, they cut you back door. You can't guard that. Is that, that because, because I've been wondering, this is the beautiful Dan Tony, whose offense in Phoenix, like, it's was beautiful. Totally, yeah, but it's totally is, different. But is that because Harden is a scorer? Because Steve Nash, like you said, he dribbled. He dominated the ball dribbling, but he was passing. Is it because Harden's looking to score, not just pass? Well, I, I think he makes an interesting point. What Jim is saying is what I said to start my radio show today. I watch Harden. I see a little Westbrook with a beard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, guys. Now, I think, hard. now Harden's a better yeah. shooter, and right. I like Harden yeah, better. Yeah, yeah. But I'm watching Houston last night, and I'm like, okay, this is a little Golden State where Paul George and Chris Paul, by the way, how's Eric Gordon played in the playoffs? He's become a spectator. How's Trevor Ariza All played in the playoffs? They become spectators. I think to some degree, and I agree with everybody's points, but are we overlooking the fact that Kevin Durant was a problem for them on the offensive end, but he was also a problem for them on the defensive end. And when you compare him and the way he played defense, 
to someone put together a nice collage mm -hmm. of how many times James Harden was lost completely on defense, a non-participant, and then the impact it had on the rest of the defensive players on the Houston Rockets. And, and again, that's why I say Kevin Durant on both ends of the court is a problem for these guys that I, I just question at some point, is there any solution? Well, here's the thing. Go back to your SAT. You got a little bit more to download to get prepared for, okay? <laughs> yes. Okay? Houston's offense was so simple. Yeah. We're going we'll to pick and roll. Yeah. And then whoever, whoever Steph guarding, we're going to guard. So now as a defensive team, all I got to do is sink in a little bit more. Yes. If you want to get your 50, bro, go ahead. You got it. Everybody else is not beating me. In the two games that Houston won, Eric Gordon had 30 and 31, okay? You had, um, Green had 29. Guys participated. You didn't see that last night. You didn't see that at all, so. Almost like Golden State wanted Harden to score four. Exactly. It was like Go it was okay. Whitlock, we use this saying, must win. But is it a must win for the Cavs? I, I never count LeBron James out. But I do feel like they have to win this game. This isn't the Indiana Pacers. Again, I, I'm a Pacer fan. I know they have a problem with LeBron James. We all know they have that uh, Toronto Raptors have a problem with LeBron James. I'm not sure if Boston has that problem in terms of LeBron may get 40, 50 tonight, but it's going to take more than just LeBron to destroy these Boston Celtics. And at some point, in order for the Cavaliers to win this series, they got to win a game on the road. And if you take the first two off the table, then I start losing faith that they'll get one later in this series. I don't. I totally disagree. First of all, LeBron and this group have won on the road. Boston is the young Sixers gagging away from being 0-5 on the road. Mm -hmm. They couldn't beat Milwaukee on the road. Basically, Philly had them beat. We both said this, Jason. That was the closest 4-1 series we've ever yeah. seen. Mm -hmm. Philadelphia gave games away. Boston's young. Young teams on the road. I mean, I always say this with my kids. The younger the kid, the more problems I get on the roller coaster in the back seat of the car. Kids get older, Colin. <laughs> no, seriously. I think Boston's going to grow up in this series, and I get you. They've been terrible on the road, but eventually. Well, I don't think it's a must win. It's close, but I think it's a must play well or must close loss. Like, at the very least, they need to play well and lose Come on, close. Cleveland. Yeah, Cleveland. Right. If they get blown away, then, now look, they've got veterans that came back from 3-1 in the finals. We know that. So they might not lose heart, but the Jordan Clarksons, the Rodney Hoods, guys that you're going to need in this series, they might lose heart if they get blown out. But if they play it close, to all your points, they're going to win the next two games in Cleveland. They only have to win one. They got chances in game five and game seven in Boston. So I, I don't think it's quite a must. Scott, I think you were reading my notes because I was going to say the same thing about the road. Because to me, Boston is so critical that they go in and, and two, two and oh. They can't go on the road one and one. They can't. They can't oh, yeah. do it just because they haven't performed. They've been close. Now, in the Philly game, Philly kind of tricked that one off themselves. No, no question. I think the mental mindset of them taking care of home court and saying, we're up to all on this team. They've been playing with house money all throughout the playoffs. But now they're, <clears throat> they're saying, we're going to legitimize this by beating the King twice at home. That gives us a little leeway for us going on the road. If you go on the road, you're 1-1. You lose those two games? Yeah. Come on, Which that's they a whole... probably would. And now the mental pressure to come back home and try to win... The pressure now shifts to young guys who haven't been there. LeBron, I got more confidence in LeBron being down 0-2 yeah. than I do in Boston being 1-1. I was going to say, so it's more of a must-win That's what I was going to say. Boston. Yeah. Do y'all feel like there's more pressure on the Celtics than on the Cavaliers tonight? Oh, absolutely. There's no question. Listen, 10 days ago, Boston was in a Game 7 <laughs> at home with Milwaukee. We were entering the fourth quarter, and it was a coin flip. Mm -hmm. Let's not pretend these are the Larry Bird Celtics. I'll tell you what I think is most important tonight. Cleveland winning the top three in the lottery. I, no, I, I'm dead serious. Yeah, I heard you if Cleveland's in the top three in the lottery, I believe LeBron 75% stays. LeBron loses tonight. He goes home, evens it up. It's a three-game series. I get LeBron. I'll take it. If LeBron and the Cavs are 12th in the lottery tonight, can't do anything with this roster. You lose to Boston. You're not coming back to Cleveland. That reshapes the league. LeBron losing tonight doesn't reshape anything. They'll go home and win two in Cleveland. If they finish number one, two, or three in the lottery, 
Jason, they either get the next Jason Tatum or they can trade it for a star. That that remains the biggest story tonight. I'm going to disagree with you a little bit just because the draft is so much of a crapshoot now because the kids are 19 when they come in. You can get a great player at number 12. You can get a great player anywhere Clay in the top Donovan 15. Mitchell. You can get, you can if if you yeah, are as good as Danny Ainge or some of these other guys, you can find a great player in the first 15 picks. So I, I disagree with you a little bit there. Y'all have made me think of the reverse and how important this game is for Boston. Look, I'll go this far. If Boston loses tonight, it's over. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, because they're going to come back to Boston 3-1 down. Yep. And, and it's and over. You know, you know who's not getting a lot of credit? We're giving a lot of credit, and I have to, to Brad Stevens. But Ty Lu, yep. his ability to make adjustments defensively, we saw it in the Indiana series, how he switched up, how he was guarding the pick and roll on the depot. You know how hard it is to have to be able to coach LeBron James, the up days, the down days, when he feels like he's in the mood. He's not getting credit. Watch the adjustments that's going to take place in tonight's game defensively and offensively for Cleveland. Yeah. And it's not because of LeBron. Yeah. It's because of what Ty Lue is Ty Lue has yeah. been overshadowed by Quinn Snyder and Brad Stevens. Yep. Ty Lue outcoached Nate McMillan in that series. You go back to that series, Ty Lue had a great series against the Pacers. I think we're looking so much at all these other coaches because, let's be honest, Kerr's famous, D'Antoni's famous. LeBron coaches the Cavs. (laughs) Hold on, but you know what, though? But Phil Jack, if you look at – I did a thing, right? And I don't know where it's at. It's in here somewhere. Ty Lue's first 50 games in playoffs, all right? He's won – he's tied with Phil Jackson, 37 and 13. He's ahead of Pat Riley and ahead of Greg Popovich. All of them had transformational yeah. players. Yeah. All of them walked in and they had somebody there. Yeah. But, of course, they get overshadowed yeah. because they have these superstars that don't get the credit. And Ty Lue right there in 50 games. Well, That's right tied and with most, Phil if not all of them, probably had more talent all up and down the roster than Ty Lue. Mm-hmm. When Ty Lue got that job, I had a friend who worked for the Clippers, and he said, let me tell you, among coaches, Ty Lue was very respected. Mm-hmm. I think Ty Lue gets overshadowed by higher-profile coaches, I think he's had a really good playoffs.